Well, welcome, church. So, um, just for the next kind of 15, 20 minutes, myself and then John uh, is going to be bringing a, a message of encouragement this morning. The job of any preacher in any church ought to be to encourage, to comfort, and to inspire faith. Encourage, comfort, and inspire faith. So that's what we're going to attempt to do for the next few minutes, if that's okay. And, uh, and so here at Springs Church, these last few weeks, we've been getting back to, uh, to, to the basics of Christianity. We've been getting back to the roots of Christianity. You see, Christianity is not complicated. It's actually really simple. When Jesus was walking the earth 2,000 years ago, he came to set the record straight, and it simply was this. Religion, meh. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself, and you're going to be just fine. He came to simplify, to make it beautifully, powerfully simple. And so we've been going back to the simplicity, the basics of our faith. To be a Christian, can I encourage you this morning, any perfect people in the room? Tumbleweed. There are no perfect people in the room this morning. To be a Christian does not mean that you are a perfect saint, halo-wearing, holier-than-thou type walking around the community. That is not what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian at its most basic is realizing that you're not perfect. Hey. <laughs> Cheers, bro. Realizing you're not perfect. And that only Jesus, the perfect Son of God, can lead us back to God and know that not only in this life we can have life to the full, but in the next life to come, we're going to be just fine. To be a Christian is simply this to believe the gospel. The gospel simply means good news. Jesus isn't asking you to believe bad news. He's not asking you to believe corrupt news. He's, he's not a liar. He's not a swindler. He's not a salesman. Jesus came to bring good news. And the good news is this. God loves you. Turns out that God is not far off at all. In fact, he is very close. The good news is that God doesn't hate any single person in this room today. Some of you walked in thinking, I'm going to burn when I go in that church. It doesn't happen, does it? God doesn't hate people. He passionately loves us all. The good news is this, that our souls stained by the sins of our lives are washed away by faith in Jesus Christ. Our personal sin and the consequences of humanity's sin, it deserves punishment, but Christianity is the belief that Jesus on the cross paid the punishment that we were heading for. The gospel is this, that a life following Jesus transforms us from the inside out in the most incredible ways. As we let Jesus, who called himself the light of the world, shine upon and dispel every shadow in our heart and soul. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. Last week, Ben, um, father of Evelyn, was preaching and he, he, uh, he used this, uh, this scripture. It says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Everyone. The average Joe the poorest of the poor, the richest of the rich, whoever you are, wherever you are, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. A little later on in the, in the Bible, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. The old things are gone. And behold, the new has come. Fresh starts sound good, don't they? Real good. But 2,000 years ago, there was a guy called Paul who had a fresh start. This guy was not a nice guy. You can read for yourself in the book of Acts in the second half of the Bible. He was a nasty, no good piece of work. And then one day he met Jesus very, very really. And it changed everything. Paul became a Christian. He started to follow Jesus. Not just the teachings of Jesus, but the lifestyle of Jesus. Uh, the kindness of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, and the truth of Jesus. Paul was so excited about his life being turned around that he couldn't help himself telling everyone he met. And if it wasn't for this guy called Paul, there would be no church 2,000 years later as we're sitting here today. It's quite incredible. As he shared his story, people became Christians too. And so what happens is this. Paul ends up writing a whole bunch of letters so that people who came, uh, who were born after he was around, could hear what he had to say. Anyone happy about that? Otherwise, the good news would have stayed old news. But it's present good news. He wrote a letter to his friends in Rome. It's in a letter called Romans coming up on the screen. And he reminds, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
We have been justified. And then a little later on in the same letter, in his chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Therefore, anyone that's become a Christian, they need to know this. There is no, no condemnation whatsoever for anyone who is found to have faith in Christ Jesus. The world might condemn you, but you give your life into the hands of God, God ain't condemning you. Wow. Let's have a bit of fun. I don't know if you're a Christian or not. I don't know if you're a person of faith or not. But let's just assume, for instance, right now, that, that every single one of us became a Christian. Can we at least assume that? Or can we just pretend for a sec? Let's pretend that each person in this room became a Christian. You, you asked God to forgive your sin, and he did. Your life is made new in the sight of God. And, and someone who knows you well, but maybe someone who's not your biggest fan, has this to say about you. After death, they get to go to heaven. And in this life, they get to experience the blessing of God. I know who they are, and I know what they've been up to. They don't deserve that. Imagine you became a Christian and someone said these things. There's no way that person deserves what God is willing to give them. There's no way that they belong up there with him. They, don't, they belong down there, if anything. It's totally out of order for my imperfect friend to get anywhere near the perfection of God. It's totally unjustifiable that God would love them. But that scripture we read before, he said, by faith we justified justified, justified. By faith, we're justified. What justifies us in God's sight is not our hard work and effort to be the best person we can be. What justifies us uh, before God is not us trying to be the perfect saint and giving all our money to charity and being the kind. Those, those things are brilliant and really good, but what justifies us in God's sight is our acceptance of the reason and the reality that Jesus went to the cross on our behalf. Faith says this, or faith is this, you don't have to believe in God, but you do. You don't have to recognize your own flaws, but because you're humble, you do. You don't have to come clean with God if you don't want to, but you want to. You don't have to let Jesus save you, but you recognize it's quite a good idea. You don't have to walk in God's ways, but you get the sense that there's something beautiful about God's ways. You could live your own truth, but you suspect that somewhere out there there's a perfect truth, and so you opt into God's truth instead. You don't have to hand in your notice as CEO of me, myself, and I, but you reckon God would do a really good job if he was in that position. And so you give him that position. Anyone who invites Jesus in can call God Father. There is no condemnation for those people. There's just a lot of peace. Thanks, Pete. Just to kind of <clears throat> bring this into land, we're going to look at a, another verse from, uh, from that, uh, that same chapter of Romans in just a moment. Um, one of my favorite sayings, uh, and one of the sayings I believe that annoys my wife intensely, is this. I often say, well, it's not a matter of life and death. In other words, something's gone a bit wrong, but actually, so what? It's not a matter of life and death. Is it really that important that I came back from the garden with really muddy hands and, and washed my hands and dried up on the tea towel rather than the hand towel? It's not a matter of life and death. Is, is it really a problem that I was painting and, and I forgot to put a, a, a ground sheet down and, and I tipped a tin of paint on the new carpet. You know, it's not a matter of life and death, is it? You know, <laughs> Well, it, it could be. <clears throat> it could be. But actually, if you apply that really, nothing other than life and death is a matter of life and death. Is it nothing, you know, that if you really, really apply it, and I try not to, you just go through life not caring about anything whatsoever. But this verse from Romans talks about life and death. This is amazing because Paul later in the chapter says, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's life. And then he gives us a whole long list of things, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us 
from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing at all, nothing in earth, nothing in heaven, nothing that's been created, nothing in hell, not our worries, our doubts, nothing can separate us from God's love. What Paul didn't say was this. He didn't say that you would always be aware of that. There may very well be times in your life when you're not aware that God doesn't love you. You know, you may feel as if you're not loved by God, but nothing can actually separate. You may have done something that you think is so terrible that you can't imagine God ever loving you. You may not feel as if God loves you, but Paul says no matter what, nothing can separate you from the love of God and Jesus. And that's one of the promises that we want to say over Evelyn and Daniel. We want to say that no matter what they do in their lives, no matter where they go, no matter what they learn, no matter what they end up doing, nothing can separate them from God's love. They may not always be aware of God's presence with them, but he will be there whether or not they know it. So that's a promise we want to give them. But we also want to leave them with another verse, probably from the most famous chapter in the Bible of all, Psalm 23. And we want to proclaim this blessing, as we've already blessed them in other ways, over their lives, but over the lives of everyone here. Because Psalm 23, verse 6, at the end says this, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. King David had 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 an amazing life. He wrote this psalm. He'd been a shepherd. He'd been a king. He'd been an adulterer. He'd been a wonderful leader. He'd really lived life to the full. And he wrote these words, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. There's a, there's a version of the, uh, the Bible called the Passion Version, and, and that version basically says not just that they follow me, but that they pursue me. There's a passion about God's love for you. I'm just going to end with this, this story. Uh, earlier in this week, I, I had the privilege of talking to uh, a lovely lady that I'd not really met before at, uh, in our community center. She's actually here today, and she knows... I'm going to share this, uh, but I'm not going to tell you who it is. You can have to work out for yourself. But, but this lady was talking to me uh, earlier this week, and she said that when she was a little girl, when she became to, to know and have a relationship with God through Jesus, she had either, a, as a five- or six-year-old, I think it was, she had a dream or a vision of Jesus. And with Jesus were two angels And she believed that these angels were there because she thought God was saying to her that uh, the angels would protect her during the day, one angel in the day and one angel at night. And I thought that was really interesting. And she had this vision uh, of Jesus and and she gave her life to the Lord as as a young girl. And then as I was just thinking about this service and what to share with you and what to say, I don't know if you noticed that twice in our formal part of our service, we talked about angels following Evelyn and Daniel. We actually pray, we use the words of Jesus where he said that, 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 that God would appoint angels to look after them and we ask for those angels to follow them. And I want to suggest to you, and this is based on some theological teaching, that actually the name of the angels that follow them are goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. So we want to say to you that for Daniel and Evelyn, we believe those angels of goodness and mercy will not just follow them, but pursue them. Now, it's interesting that it says that the angels will follow. That kind of implies walking behind or even pursuing. It it implies that you're ahead and, and you're being sought after by the angels. And I think that's really important because God, for whatever reason, didn't make life always as straightforward as I think he could have done. I don't know why he did it this way, but, but he doesn't promise that we'll always have an angel right in front of us showing us the way to go. But what he promises is that they will be following us up. What that means is that there are certain times where you have to work at your faith. They, as they grow up, will have to work at their faith. The Bible is there for us to, to lead us. One of the Psalms says that God's word will be uh, 
a, a light to our path. In other words, it will show us the way to go if we seek him. And it will also be a lamp to our feet. In other words, it will stop us from stumbling on that path. But we have to go to his word to find that guidance. We have to seek God. There will be times in their lives where they pursue God. But in that pursuit of God, I want to say that they will also have these angels of goodness and mercy pursuing them, following them. And if you're a Christian, no matter how old you are, whether you're as young as, as Daniel and Evelyn or whether you're, you've lived for many, many years, we just want to share with you that God's goodness, God's mercy can be there for you. I think we're now going to have a song which will cover very appropriately uh, what we've just been sharing with you. Amazing. So we're very blessed to have Dan and uh, Jen as part of our worship team here at Springs, and they're, they're going to perform a song called Goodness of God. Um, as you leave today, uh, later on, if anyone's in the room today and they say, do you know what, I'm intrigued, I want to know more, um, we've got a little pack for you, a welcome pack, and it just helps you to understand the first few steps of what it is to have faith in God like we've been talking about today. This isn't your ticket to heaven, all right, but this is a little bit of help along the way to explain things. So, Dan, Jen, bless you.
around is something that we can stand on, that actually we can have an understanding that every good gift comes from our Father. Everything that is good is the, the hallmark of you. And Lord, I thank you that for your love, for your peace, for your guidance, Father, I thank you that we can be in a place where we can um, ask the big questions about eternity and what goes beyond this present existence. And Father, I thank you that you give us the freedom here to explore that. And Lord, I pray for anyone here that may be questioning and, and wondering about whether this is real for them. Father, I pray that you would speak to them through your Holy Spirit, that they would understand and have a revelation of who you are to them. God, I pray that you would help them to find a peace in you. So as they walk into the, the days coming up, the tomorrow and the rest of the week and further on, Father, I pray that they would know that your goodness is walking with them, that you are with them, that you are good, that all good gifts come from God our Father. Almighty God. Amen.